When you think of economic policy and the so-called free market in action, what do you think of? Ronald Reagan in the 80s? Hong Kong in the 90s? Or somewhere like, I don't know, South Sudan? Yeah, the East African country that was literally born out of decades of civil war, violence, and the total absence of a functioning government. I asked a question because that's where historian Jacob Sowell says perhaps the only pure free market economy existed in recent times, one literally free of any governance or regulations. Sol, who teaches history at the University of Southern California, is the author of a new book called Free Market, The History of an Idea. The book tells the story of where the idea of free markets came from, how its meaning has been corrupted and why it's in crisis in the West today. One thing is certain, he writes, the orthodox libertarian free market model does not exist and has never existed outside of places with no government, such as the ultra-violent frontier economies such as South Sudan. The thing is, over the last 40 years or so, here in America, Reagan and his political heirs in the Republican Party have succeeded in turning free markets, economic liberty, capitalism into almost objects of worship, to the point where no leading Democrat, with the exception of a Bernie or an AOC maybe, dares go against free market capitalism. Big government is bad, we're constantly told. Regulations are the enemies of freedom. And yet here in the U.S., well, let's just say business gets by with a little help from their friends in government, from low taxes and big bailouts to government contracts and access to state-subsidized companies and welfare programs, you name it. Republicans today and Democrats who champion this economic idea too often fail to recognize just how much of a role that government has played in guaranteeing the so-called free market. As we've said before on this show, with so many other things... It's a topic the right have led on. They've created this prevailing and false narrative around what a free market is or means. In fact, it's bound the different factions of the right together. It's the glue at the heart of the modern hard right GOP. As Sol writes in the book, hard right evangelicals were among the most influential leaders of the new free market movement. The Republican Party became an ideological mix of the mainline Northeastern establishment, American Baptist Puritanism, racism and bigotry, and a Freedman-esque and American Southwest individualist libertarianism and permissiveness, all held together by a near religious reverence for the multinational conglomerate firm and the sanctity of capital holding shareholders. Well, that is a mouthful. Joining me now to help unpack what that all means is Jacob Sowell, professor of philosophy, history, and accounting at the University of Southern California. Jake is also a recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant and the author of a not-so-unrelated 2014 book, The Reckoning, Financial Accountability and the Rise and Fall of Nations. Jake, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Congratulations on the book. Is it fair to say Republicans, the right, are behind the definition we have today of what a free market is. And to be clear, as you write in the book, it's not at all what the early proponents and thinkers had imagined. Well, absolutely. And first, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. And I'm a fan. Yes. I mean, this is, uh, as you said, a prevailing discourse, which we hear all the time. But we really always hear it in a very, I would say, superficial way. Not too many questions are asked. We live in a free market economy. It's just one supported by government, <laughs> no matter what. I don't know any examples. Yeah. I don't know counterexamples. I want to quote something you write in the book. You say, if there is a lesson to be learned here, it's that we must be suspicious of any claim that an economic system can be self-sustaining or remain in balance without significant political intervention. Even those pioneering free market philosophers who believed in economic equilibrium considered the state essential to it. This idea, Jake, the need for political intervention, it goes to the heart of almost everything that's up for debate in America, from healthcare to guns to climate change. But isn't the problem that who gets to define what significant political intervention looks like? So, you know, Friedman said it was having a military and police. The American military is, is enormous. I mean, it's more than well above $700 billion a year for the Department of Defense, and that's just a tiny part of it. So what that means is, and this happened under Reagan, and this happens under all conservative governments, or all governments, is you can juice your economy up with commands to your military for military contracting and things like that. That already is a huge network. We have veterans, we have veterans hospitals. The military is pretty socialistic. So just even yeah. Friedman's old definition is, I would say, misleading. Yeah. 
And uh, we know that free markets didn't get us out of the depression. It was a lot of spending in the run-up to World War II. We know that Ronald Reagan did a lot of deficit spending on the military in the 1980s. Let's just talk about climate change, though, because how much of the debate, Jake, do you think around economic policy today and the kind of movement on the issue of free markets, especially on the left and in the center, how much of that is being done under the shadow of the climate change debate? Because if we've learned anything with regard to the climate crisis, it's that you can't leave the market to itself. The impact on the environment may have never originally been factored in by kind of ideologues on the right, but we know that free markets have a cost, have externalities. And we know that when you tackle climate change, as President Biden's doing with the new Inflation Reduction Act, you have massive government intervention. Well, the climate proposals that are usually, quote, market-oriented have to do around carbon trading. We, we know that's already been played. Uh, it also has to do with uh, you know, getting money back from the government. That's how Elon Musk makes, makes his profits. He doesn't make them from Tesla. He gets them back. He gets money back from the federal government for selling electric cars. We've also seen that this system, as with any market system, can be played. So it doesn't necessarily seem that carbon trading and market responses are the only way we can get out of this. They do work in certain cases, and we do need innovation. Musk has created great battery technology. We need that. So it's very complicated. There's no one single answer. However, it's not clear the crisis we're in now is so deep, just like the financial crisis, just like COVID. It's pretty clear we're going to need massive government involvement and we're going to need partnership with private companies. That's the way things happen. So whether you're for or against a uh, free market thought, I think it's sort of hard to deny that each time we have a crisis, whether it be the Great Depression, whether yeah. it be COVID, whether it be 2008, the government steps in, and then ideally, they work with industry. Yes, indeed. And just uh, your historian, just from the historical perspective expressed in your book, you look at Adam Smith, the Scottish economist uh, often called the father of capitalism. He's a hero to many on the libertarian right today. You write, quote, if there is one clear idea to take away from Smith's economic work, it is that morality is essential for a market to function. Um, Jake, when you look at capitalism in the West today, uh, the extent to which income inequality has exploded, child poverty is pretty bad. Uh, you talk about people in, uh, you know, in, in Wall Street. You talk about uh, price gouging oil company executives. Not much talk about morality there. We're told that you know this is all hidden hand. This is all you know. This is how it's supposed to work. Don't worry about morality. That's got nothing to do with it. But Adam Smith didn't think that. Well, we were told, you know, Reagan said greed is good. There is no one statement that goes against Smith's philosophy more than that. Smith was a Ciceronian neo-Stoic, so he was a Stoic moral philosophy. Stoics believe that you have to, above all, be good through self-discipline and moral service to the state. I mean, that's the basis of Stoicism, and that was, that was Smith's kind of partial religion. Smith believed that there was greed, and he thought that a moral class of people and a, and a possibly moral government, and he was very skeptical that that was completely possible, would be the kind of invisible hand, that society would be the invisible hand that could keep the inherent greed that humans have from getting out yeah. of control and undermining the nation. He was very worried about greedy people investing outside of Britain and the British Empire.